Okay, now let's see the questions said. here. So the second one, did Solar Winds and its CISO ignore repeated red flags about the company's cybersecurity vulnerabilities? And Jim, you started talking about this, right? Especially when you talked about, uh, you know, supply team, uh, supply chain issues and michael you talked about right nation state attackers and i mean ultimately the the audience needs to know what there were eighteen thousand potential victims uh at the compromise of their primary product now not all of them were victimized but uh, you know jim i'll start with you uh do you think from a risk perspective and kind of gets away from the case of fraud but just from a risk management perspective did solar winds drop the ball here uh, no, I don't have information to support that premise at all. Um, what I would say is that identity access management practice in software development in a cloud-first model across every single enterprise sucks, right? It's inadequate, insufficient, not enough. Uh, and that's every enterprise. And so we all have, every enterprise has to step up and deal with that challenge. And that's not necessarily unique to solar winds. Yeah, Michael, your thoughts? Yeah, we're, we see that across the board, right? Um, and, and I know Jim used the word DevOps. I'm getting away from DevOps, it's DevSecOps. You have to include security when you start building that product. You've got to understand what that flow of data is. So if something happens, you're right there. Um, so yeah, I think that's the first thing we need to do is make sure SDLC software development life cycle, we know what's going on with there and we're building a software platform that's gonna work and it's gonna be secure. But that starts at the beginning, it starts at the beginning of that DevSecOps. I totally agree with Jim. Yeah, um, I'm in line with you guys. I, the reality is we're the red flags, yes, but that's our daily job. We're dealing with red flags every single day. Um, and so I, you know, I haven't seen all the data. I'm, I, you know, I don't know what they knew when they knew it. And so I can't say that, yeah, there were obvious red flags that they should have jumped on. I think there were red flags, but okay, out of the million red flags that we deal with, how did we know that this combination was, you know, something so severe? Um, at the point that the security firms came to them and said, we can definitively show that your product is hacked, which is what happened in December. Uh, at that point, they did respond to it. So I do like that fact. But I'm with you guys, you know, it's, it's, it's tough, especially when there's insufficient visibility, insufficient controls, and we do not have good security baked in as part of product development across the in industry. It's not just solar winds, right? It's, well, unfortunately, it's everybody. This is just the state of maturity that we have. Another question came in here, you know, what do you think about a negotiated contract clause that provides protections and rights to private defense? I think we talked about that a little bit. Um, is that something that should be negotiated when you're taking the job? Do you think, uh, you know, Jim, and you talk with a lot of CISOs here, do you think that's something that CISOs that are currently in the job, is that something that they can, br you know, bring up with the CEO or the board to kind of implement retroactively? Is this something feasible or is it just too, you know, sticky as, as, as Michael indicated? Oh, can't hear you, Jim. I still can't hear Jim. Can okay. Then I'm going to go to Michael on this one. Um, I, I think you can negotiate anything, um, even if you're already in a CISO position. Either you're taking a new job as a CISO or you're already the CISO. The worst thing that can happen is they say no. So why not try to negotiate something? And and again, it could be kind of strange because. They may say, hey, we want you to use this particular law firm, and if they're already using it, it could be a conflict, but why not give it a shot? I mean, you're going to go to the table and ask for things you might as well. Yeah. The worst case they can say is no, right? And then you've got to make a decision whether you're comfortable with that or not. Um, yeah, correct. Jim typed in here, and I'll read it for him. Um, yes, you should discuss this. If you are a current CISO, the probability of resolution is not high. <laughs> given the lack of leverage yeah you know I, I i think he's absolutely spot on there absolutely spot on so that kind of brings us back you know when we talked 
talk about this DNO and ENO and uh, coverage. Do you think this may perhaps change the insurance industry? Do you think the insurers are going to start offering something special, something unique for CISOs because of this demand, because of this case, uh, and they see an opportunity to, to expand their market? What are your guys' thoughts? Mike, Michael, I'll start with you. I think Jim will probably have to type his answer. Um, I think it's absolutely possible. I mean, look at what happened with cyber insurance. There was not a market. All of a sudden, there's a huge market for cyber insurance. Um, it, it's going to be a tough one because we I don't think we have enough data to be able to support that right now. Um, as we see, depending on what happens with this case, as we see more and more of them, absolutely, there'll be a market for it. I mean, anytime they can drum up a market, they're going to. Uh, I think Jim's still typing here. Oh, so he says the evolution of indemnic indemnification coverage originates from Delaware law based on three levels. But again, from a business perspective, I would say, generally speaking, if insurance agencies and industry, you know, smell blood in the water and think that they make pro they can make a profit, I think they would probably explore that opportunity to um, increase their overall